Biologists put GPS or satellite tracking devices on big game, upland game, fur bears, and waterfall. In this week's program, we're visiting with conservation biologist Sandra Johnson to talk about two non-game species with tracking devices. I'm Mike Anderson with the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. Sandra, we have a couple of non-game bird species that we've put uh, transmitters on. What species are those and why did we choose those species? So the first species that we put tags on is the long-billed curlew, and that's a large shorebird that nests in far southwestern North Dakota. Uh, Jay Carlisle is a researcher with Boise State University, and he has tagged more than 100 curlews <clears throat> in western United States, like Idaho, Wyoming. Uh, so another partner of ours, Kevin Ellison with American Bird Conservancy asked Jay, hey, we've got some work on curlews in North Dakota and if he'd come over and, and take some curlews. So we did that in 2022 and 2023. Uh, another project we have is taking Western Meadowlarks and that's with Andy Boyce of the Smithsonian Institute and Susan Feligi of University of North Dakota. The Western Meadowlark is, is slowly declining about 1% per year. Uh, but we know even from the, the public, people don't see metal arcs like they used to. Uh, Long-billed curlews are, are doing okay, but yeah, they're another grassland nesting bird that have definitely declined over the years. Sandra, how many western metal arcs have we tagged and how many long-billed curlews have we tagged in North Dakota? And when we say tag, we're talking mm -hmm. about GPS or satellite transmitters. Yeah, so when we say we tag a bird, it, it means that we're, we're capturing the bird and applying, it's a, it's a backpack, but it doesn't go around their wings, it goes around their legs and it sits on their back. So we've tagged 11 Western Meadowlarks over two years, and for long-billed curlews, we've also tagged 11 birds over two different years, and same thing, it's a backpack style transmitter um, that sits on their back. Uh, those transmitters, some are satellite based, so we're getting really consistent locations because it's, it's, the satellite is communicating to us pretty regularly. Uh, some of the GPS transmitters, we're getting super accurate locations, but those are either, the data is transmitted either satellites or most of them are, are now cellular networks. So when the bird flies by a cellular tower, then the data is uploaded. How do biologists or these researchers, mm -hmm. how do they trap these birds? So with western meadowlarks and other um, small grassland birds like that, researchers use something called a mist net. So it's a, a very fine um, mesh net that they put up. They find where like a meadowlark is singing on its territory, a meadowlark by a fence post. And these are typically the males. Uh, so they put this net up close to that territory and then they use a lure, like an audio call of a meadowlark um, or a mounted meadowlark. And that male meadowlark is, you know, just angry that someone's in his territory. So eventually he flies into the, the fine mist net and we capture him. The long-billed curlews, it's a, a little bit more, takes time just out there being in the grasslands where we know there's curlews at and getting there right at sunrise and watching where the curlews are at. And it's really just keeping an eye on, on a curlew and they switch um, incubation duties so you're watching where that female walks and the male gets off the nest and we're able to pinpoint where that nest is at. Same type of thing where we take a, a mist net but now you're carrying it out and placing it over the bird and okay. capturing it. So it's they're both near their nesting sites? Yep, yep, capturing birds on the nesting sites, yep. Okay, so, so the main purpose for both of these species is trying to find out what habitats they're using here and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. Is, what type of habitats are these birds using in North Dakota during the breeding season? How long are they staying here? When do they leave? Where do they go? Um, when they come back, do they come back to those same grasslands? So it's, it's all of it. It's the, the full life cycle of these grassland birds. Are we finding out some information? Yes, so it's, it's really interesting. These are both grassland birds that nest on the ground in our beautiful grasslands in North Dakota. Um, they both arrive back in North Dakota fairly early. They're arriving in mid-April. Um, the long-billed curlew, so they start nesting, laying eggs in early May. Um, once those eggs hatch, the adults leave pretty quick. So the, 
The females might leave by the end of June. Um, males might stick around a little bit longer into July. But something like the Western Meadowlark, they're using that same breeding territory where we take them at, and they might have a couple of broods, so they're using those grasslands, they're staying there through mid-October. Are they using the, the same general area, like the curlews when they mm -hmm. come back every spring? Are they, are they going to the same habitats? Yeah, yeah it, it's pretty amazing with these tracking devices that when they've left North Dakota after we've, we've trapped and tagged them that first year, um, and when they come back the following year, they go right back to the same spot. I mean, basically within a mile of where they, they nested the previous year. And with these tags, you can, some of them are, are quite accurate, so you can actually see their new nest site, and it's not that far from where they nested the previous year. Same with meadow larks too. Uh, the, the tags are that accurate. We know that where we tagged them the first year, they come back and they're using that, that same breeding territory. They're going right back to that same fence post, you know, where, where the, we tagged them last year. So those habitats are very important to, to maintain. Yeah, yep, yep. These grasslands, if, if they leave and they come back the following year and something's happened in that grassland, maybe something's been developed or um, the grassland has been converted, uh, yeah, they come back and now they're wondering, well, where am I gonna go? Because they'll have to hurry up and try to find a new territory and those might already be occupied by other birds. And these areas are very important. There are grasslands and we're losing grasslands in North Dakota. So it's really important that we maintain grasslands, that we maintain ranching. You know, you don't see a meadow lark unless there's, there's cattle there usually. So it's really important that we keep grasslands on the landscape. You say they leave in the fall. Where do they go and is it important to track where they stop on their mm -hmm. way to their wintering grounds? Yeah, so that, that's one thing that we don't know a lot about with some of these non-game birds and part of it is just the technology has gotten better so these devices are smaller and lighter. Birds don't weigh very much and you don't want to put a, a whole lot of weight on their back so the technology has just really improved where we can take something like a, a metal arc. Uh, so yeah, we, I mean, we generally know where meadowlarks winter, but we don't know where the North Dakota population is going. So what we found is most of these western meadowlarks, they're staying up here using grasslands of North Dakota till mid-October, and then they leave. They might make a quick stop over in South Dakota, refuel, find some food, um, but most of them went to uh, eastern Nebraska and eastern Kansas. But we did have one metal arc go all the way down to Arkansas, like eastern Arkansas, which is the edge of western metal arc range. That's a long ways. That's a long ways, yeah, and just kind of surprising that one of the metal arcs went that far. We, we kind of guessed that they would be going to Kansas, Nebraska, um, but metal arcs, I mean, winter all the way down to Texas and Mexico, and we haven't had any go that far yet, but. Okay, how about our curlews? So the curlews, when they leave, and the, the females are typically leaving first, they're leaving in June, and the males maybe in July, and they will migrate. Some of them are going to uh, western Texas, the panhandle of Texas. Some are in eastern New Mexico, and they might stop there for a couple weeks or several months. Um, and then they might, they might stay there all winter, but we've had several that have gone to the the coast of Texas and Mexico, the Laguna Madre, so that's where the ocean meets uh, freshwater, and it, it's just a, a great bird area. There's there's a lot of our North Dakota birds that go there in winter, but so some are hanging out by the beach, some go into central Mexico, um, and then yeah, some are kind of in more urban, rural areas of Texas. Sandra, where's the funding come for some of these projects? So for tagging longbill curlews, the funds come from the Watchable Wildlife Tax Checkoff. So you see that on your tax forms this time of year. So that's the funds that we use to buy the transmitters and have the researcher come out here and apply the tags. Okay, and how about the metal arc? Is that just the general conservation fund? So the metal arc tagging is part of a state wildlife grant um, where we're monitoring uh, how grassland restoration, how the occupancy of birds uh, changes. Um, but yeah, as another objective of that grant, we're tagging metal arcs. Okay, and you're finding out a lot of great information with all with these projects as far as habitats and mm -hmm. what these birds need to survive. Yeah, it's just really amazing to know that these birds, that they go back to the same spot, basically, the, the same general area where they're tagged. So if, if you're out there and you, you see a metal arc in a fence post and the next year you see, see another metal arc on the fence post, it's, it's probably that bird that was there. That, that's their breeding territory.
lot of great information, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.